Now, what we'll do is look at uh, introduction to instrumentation for electrical <coughs> test and measurement. We're going to look at the traditional ways you're working with today and also some of the ways that are still being done and that using individual pieces of instrument as we go through this course. So let's take a look at accurate measurements. And you can see that there's a variety of things. You have to ask the question every time you look at your test, why is this measurement being made? You need to understand that. Now, many times it's written in the spec, isn't it? You'll notice that, right? It's in the spec. But many times that's not right. What happens is that just because it's been done for the last 10 years that way, that doesn't mean that it can't be improved upon or actually taken out of the test depending on whether other things cover the same thing. So what you have to do when you actually ask this question is, what is the accuracy you need? Or uncertainty. Uh, you look at that and then you're able to determine what the individual components you're using to make this measurement are to come up with that particular accuracy. And every device that you have within your test environment has a certain amount of performance. The actual instruments, the transducers, the wiring that you're using actually has certain performance characteristics. And how you mount a sensor or a transducer really will determine how accurate that measurement can be. One of the trickiest things that comes to mounting essentially is what kind of sensors? Strain gauges. Have you, have you worked with strain gauges, Matt? Oh, yeah. Have you mounted right. them? Yep. And it's an art, isn't it? Yeah. It it's really an art. And it takes some time to become good at it. And many people who actually go to a course to actually do that can't do it worth a hoot at the beginning of the class. And sometimes it's questionable at the end of the class. So it takes a lot of effort and art to do that. Now, where it's located, where that transducer is located, makes a big, big difference, doesn't it? Yes. And that has to do with maybe it's very close to some external noise you have to be concerned with. Uh, uh, maybe the doggone transducer is too big. If it has too much mass, you're not getting a correct measurement of what you're looking at. And, of course, the environment's important. I think you mentioned environmental testing to a degree. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I have to deal quite a bit with the environment. I mean, out of the field with our wind turbines, and um, you know, I've worked quite a bit with uh, meteorological towers. So it's uh, yeah, quite a. I mean, we got to deal with them quite a bit. It's amazing how many of those are being put up lately, and how big they are. Yeah. You mentioned ones that uh, when you looked at the one you were talking about installing. Now, how many story building is that equivalent to? That's a uh, 85 meter towers. I mean, we're looking at 200 and. 70 feet at least. Almost a football field, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Almost a football field. And then the, the actual performance can make a difference. Now, the other thing you need to do, other than looking at the environment and the other aspects, is the data. The type you want and how much you want. You know, you can overburden yourself with data tremendously. Sometimes when you're doing testing, what you might do is you might just sample every minute or two some information and do a pre analysis on that to see if you need to increase the sample rate. Uh, this can be a very effective way of doing it. Of course, the bottom line is how much does it cost? You ever notice that management never wants to actually spend the amount of money it really takes to do the measurement? You have to cut back. And one of the areas they cut back in, which is not very good, is what they call an anti-alias filter. And in today's world, a lot of times they say, well, we can do that with software. Well, that's incorrect. You still have to have a physical anti-alias filter to acquire the data properly. And once you've got the proper acquisition of data, then you can apply software filtering. This is something you need to really look into. Now, if we look at a, a generalized system here, and you take a look, and let me get this situation right here. Spotlight. And you take a look at the actual input, the measurement, and the measurement is actually what you're trying to measure. And then the sensors build up of basically a couple of items, main items, is the item part that is sensing the measurement itself. And then the conversion aspect to convert it to an electrical signal. For instance, when you're measuring pressure, you're actually doing by pressuring something against it 
And then what will happen is you need to actually take that and convert that movement into some electrical signal that represents the actual pressure that's being done. Now in the data acquisition actual S system itself, you'll take and look at the quantify the sub uh, sorry, electrical parameter and then you that basically will look at this and then you'll get a measurement out or measurement out and then a lot of times what will happen is you'll just actually take and acquire that data or do some calculations. Now, I'm not sure, do you acquire the data and do calculations on your test system or do you send the data to a central authority to actually do the analysis? Ourselves. Do it yourself. How about you, Matt? Um, it depends. I mean, we do it most mostly in general testing. We do ourselves, but we do have a third party that certifies our wind turbines that they acquire yeah. some of the data. A lot of testing does require that someone else do the analysis. Typically, there's a couple of reasons. For instance, Caterpillar Tractor does that. They actually acquire the data. They might do some pre-analysis to make sure that they're working within the right range or something of that nature. But when it comes to the uh, final analysis, they have a lot of math majors that are doing that. Ones that really understand the advanced mathematics to be able to do that. How about you, Omar? Do you actually uh, analyze the data in your programs locally, or do you send the information uh, that you No, take? we actually analyze ourselves the data. Okay. Now, yeah. one of the things you've got to be careful about when you do your own analysis, if that then verified to be correct. Like, do you have an organization that verifies that the equations and the data that you use, the limits and range, are actually correct? See, that's one of the problems sometimes, is that you're assuming it's okay. Because I've seen cases where a lot of people have done analysis and they've actually been wrong for 10 years. Of course, I guess that's the old expression, ignorance is bliss, isn't it, Jake? Yeah. You were shaking your head yes to the statement I just made. Yeah, we we uh, had a merger with one of our other companies, and uh, in the process, it's who does it the best way. Yes. And so we were reviewing a lot of their test setups and procedures, and they would review ours, and they would come back and say, why do you guys do all of this extra work? And we said, well, you're not doing it right, which is why it looks like we're doing a lot of extra work. Right. And uh, we found where, uh, like you said before, missing into alias filters, um, Sampling too Sampling slow ratio. for yeah. what they were trying to do. Um, wrong scaling when they were actually using pick or uh, inline transformers for um, things like that. The so op amps were wrong. Sensitivities were wrong. I mean, there was a lot of issues that they were able to get away with for a long time because right. they make a product that's like this book. You can take a beating, so you yes. don't have to be as accurate. And we're making something more like a laptop where we have to be very accurate because. If do something wrong, we're going to create an issue that's not really there. Yes. So it was right. not apples to apples, but in the process we learned that they can get away with not being nearly as accurate as we need to be in our How many computers are in a typical car now, Jay? Uh, the loaded question depends on the manufacturer. I know, but... I would say here in the U.S. you're usually looking at five or six now. Five um, or six over now. in Europe you're up to eight, and in Asia you're only at like three. And then you're actually, actually that's the the computer aspects of it, but then a lot of your sensors have computers built into it now. A lot of them are, yeah, set protocols and things like that where they're actually converting it to a pulse wave modulated or something specifically in analog that's not. Or it's, it's becoming it's converting more. Converting it to digital even yeah. though it's an analog input. Which actually indicates that the software aspect's even more and more important. And I believe the Volkswagen indicated that recently, didn't they? <laughs> On that. And I also have noticed that in the news they say that the cars, automobiles, cannot be hacked. They have to have hacking preventions in them. Correct. They can okay. be hacked. You can override a lot of the electronics. Just if you're uh, going to be uh, challenging some advanced robbery, you better make sure you have an old car, the 1970s variety before. <laughs> okay, now you notice this arrow that's coming down here going back this way. A lot of times you can have actually a, an error signal that goes back and provides some feedback. Most of the systems are open loop though, aren't they? Most of the systems are open loop, especially when you're just doing data acquisition to acquire the data specifically. But in a control system in a car, it has to be closed loop, doesn't it? Because that's where you're getting your feedback specifically to be able to make the corrections on that. 
And then, of course, below this is kind of like here's the measure and the transduction, the conversion of that voltage into what you're looking at, the analysis, and the source, the display. And, of course, we don't use a clipboard anymore, do we? Or do we? I've run across places where they're still using clipboards, literally. I don't know if you want to buy their product or not. Components. Okay, now, so the components that exist, and you'll notice that with respect to this uh, diagram here, that we have our system, our preliminary sensing elements, the trans uh, transducer, signal conditioning, the analog and digital conversion that may be made, data transmission and telemetry if it exists, and signal analysis of the output. You'll also notice it's possibility that it'll feed back at different points. But your environment is really influencing this all around. Now, in this case here, this primary sensing element is the type of transducer you're working with. Whether you're measuring pressure, strain gauges, variety of things, or linear distance in that. Now, the transducer itself usually has a very, very low signal out, doesn't it? Down in the microvolt level sometimes, maybe millivolt if you're lucky. And that signal has to be raised up to such a level, or you can see the environment around it could cause that to be modified somewhat. So what you need to do is you need to get what they call a decent signal to noise ratio. Very important. If your signal is buried in your noise, you're never going to be able to get it out without a lot of specialized software and conditions you're going to be working with. Now once you've got that up to a proper level, then you're going to take a look and see whether you're going to keep it digitally or go into analog. And then the data transmission and telemetry, that would be used with something that's uh, quite removed from the device itself. For instance, say you're doing an, uh, a flight test on some sort of aircraft. And many times what they'll do is they'll have a, a local data being stored. In the past it used to be mag tapes, but now it's disk drives. Or in, in fact, not even disk drives anymore. It's just big chips isn't it? Of, of memory that you can store it on. And then uh, the majority of that's stored there and many times what will happen is that to be able to detect whether the test is working properly or not, some of that will be transmitted from the aircraft down to the ground station and looked at and determined whether things are functioning properly or not. And then, of course, you have your output. So this is components of an instrumentation system. So this is a basic radio telemetry system block diagram. You have your devices. That's your transducers. Or sens uh, sensors. Then you have signal conditioning possibly based on this. Now the signal conditioning typically is amplifiers, instrumentation amplifiers that boost that low level signal up to a reasonable amount. And then in this case here it gets modulated on RF amplifier and then transmitted down to let's say a ground station or somewhere else in the environment. It receives it, demodulates it, and then it processes the data and then it stores it. Uh, have any of you ever used this kind of a method to transmit data down? How about you, Jake? Have you ever? Uh, we don't currently, but I would like to in the future. You would like to in the future. How about you, Matt? Probably not to this scale. I mean, we've used some telemetry systems, mostly on our rotating main shaft uh, to measure strain. So yes. we've had mounted the strain gauge on the main shaft, and then there's a uh, telemetry system to get the signal. There's a little telemetry system to receive the data. Yeah, basically Hopefully, get it off the rotating shaft to a stationary. It makes it a lot easier than trying to hook a bunch of wires up there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, we're talking a matter of a foot or a foot and a half distance not, compared to... Not, you know, not uh, several miles. Miles, basically. yeah. I remember up in the Canadian Air Force, they actually had the metrology lab, which is amazing to me. The metrology lab, uh, lab asked for two functional jets. They actually got them. You know, you're talking about multi-million dollar aircraft, which they performed the tests on. So they're using telemetry an awful lot. How about you, Omar? Do you actually um, work with the uh, telemetry a lot or not? No, I have not. I have not worked, but there's other organizations who work on that. Okay. Sounds good. Now, you know, how this carrier is modulated. Now, the carrier is which the signal rides on and goes from point A to point B. Now it can be phase modulation. Now what happens is 
the actual, you can see the frequency will change depending on the phase of the modulating signal. The top part here, right here, is actually the carrier wave, and then you will impress upon it effectively some sort of signal using phase modulation. A lot of times you use pulse modulation today, specifically on that. Amplitude modulation is that the information we want to preserve or capture is captured in the amplitude as far as the amplitude's difference or change depends on the magnitude of the signal. And how often it happens depends on the frequency of the modulating signal. And then, of course, in frequency modulation, the main carrier frequency is changed from the uh, main wave uh, to either be less or greater depending on where it modulates. How far it separates will determine that. Now, if you take a look at the typical AM radio, you're talking about, what, 10, 10 kilohertz? 10 kilohertz is the actual bandwidth that exists there. And uh, so, what's your hearing range? Let me put this, what's your hearing range when you're younger? 20 to 20 K. Yeah, and it tends to taper off. And as you get older, the high frequency range drops off naturally. But it really drops off. Now, did you, were you in, um, what hotel are you in, Jake? Is it Rose? Is it Rose? Did you hear that music that was playing like mad, really loud? Mm -hmm. Well, I heard it. <laughs> they had this thing blasting out for like what, a block and a half over to Tropicana. They were playing music. It was unbelievably loud. What's amazing about it is, is that you have a 10 kilohertz bandwidth and you can supposed to be here from what? 10 hertz or you know, 15 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So therefore you only have about half your range. But in frequency modulation, the signal actually is uh, quite wide. You've got a much broader signal, like 100 kilohertz on that. And so therefore, the reason they had frequency modulation in the past was for very good quality music, like from orchestras, so you could identify all the instruments while they're playing. And of course, today, it doesn't, they don't have that high range, typically, of music. 